Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to present a, a series of lectures over the next five weeks. Uh, today relates to the uh, War of Independence and the theme of the lecture is about um, from revolt to revolution to the creation of the Kingdom of Greece. The second lecture uh, looks at the uh, historiography, how our perceptions of this event evolved and were cemented over time. The third lecture examines the expansion of the Greek state after 1830, which took 127 years to, the, to its final borders in 1948. The fourth lecture examines the key historical markers in Greek history, which looks at the Asia Minor disaster and particularly the Civil War, as both events, in my view, are interrelated. And the last lecture looks at what I would call the other, in inverted commas. In other words, those within the Greek state, whether due to linguistic, religious or other differences, felt part of it or did not feel part of it. And we're going to examine the Slavophones, and I use that in, in inverted commas over time. So today, I hope that um, I can keep this lecture within one hour. Uh, I realise people are busy after, so I'll do my best to, to do that. The lecture that I present today rep represents my views. It doesn't represent the views of the Hellenic Museum. And I'm sure if you had 10 other different people coming up, you'd get a different perspective of the same event. So allow us to begin, and just bear with me with the uh, technology. As I was saying to some friends here, I was born the last century, so I'll try my best um, to, to follow as we go. Um, the theme, revolt and revolution, is not accidental. The, the query amongst many historians was whether this, this event that led to the liberation of the Greek state um, was due to a revolt, was it a revolutionary movement that, that began, or was it a number of factors, including an element of luck, that led to that. So my objective today is, is to go through that, give my interpretation of the events, and we'll see at the end uh, what your views are as well. So let's begin firstly with the, um, the notion of Greece. There was no such notion as uh, of Greece. Because as you can see from the map here, all those areas around the Eastern Mediterranean were places where there were established Greek colonies, particularly west, but on the eastern side, what we call Peninsula Greece, which is what we know as the, uh, Greece as such, and the shores of Asia Minor going right into the Black Sea, these were the, the ancient Greek tribes that settled there. And in many respects, they were indigenous or one of the first that, that arrived. From the western side, you will see that um, in southern Italy, Sicily, even up to Marseille, and as well as Spain, you had a, a whole range of Greek colonies. So the Greek world, the Greek world was not concentrated only in what we know as Peninsula Greek, the Greek state. The most significant event to impact this world at the time was the arrival uh, of the Ottomans. Now, contrary to, the, to certain beliefs in my view, they didn't arrive in 1453, they actually arrived in the 11th century and entered the east of um, the, the, the eastern part of what is modern day Turkey and they actually beat and defeated Emperor Romanos, which they actually kept captured in the Battle of Manzikert. In 2071, our neighbours next to us will be celebrating this event as part of their uh, historical memory. So the Battle of Manzikert, they capture the, the, the Emperor Romanos and they virtually uh, humiliate him. From that time on, we have the entry, the slow entry over three centuries of the demographic changes that occurred. So when the Turks arrived in the, four, in, in the 11th century, 85% of the population in Anatolia, and Anatolia, I use the term in Greek, means Eastern, 
and that's the name the Turks gave to that region as well because if you look from from Peninsula Greece East Anatoly West is, is, is this is so that's the reason the the Greeks gave uh, Anatolia the name as such so as they as they arrived we had 85 percent of the population Christian by the time they reached Constantinople in 1453 the population was around Christian population was around 20 percent so there the significant demographic changes uh, that that took place the Turks, however, uh, did not stop there. They peaked around the 17th century in terms of their, um, their expansion, eventually also taking Crete in 1670 and also taking uh, Cyprus in 1571. So there they were stopped at the gates of Vienna in 1683, and that's where we have the famous croissant that, that that was uh, invented to celebrate that event. Now, if Vienna had fallen, the expansion would have moved further. So that gives you a picture of when they came, who came, and how they moved. But the most important element that we need to remember is what was the driver. In Islam, the driver was, if you conquer land, you don't give it away you don't give it away. And if there's a parallel here, in modern day Cyprus, the northern part, the rationale is the same. You don't give it away. You don't give land away. So when the revolution took place in, in uh, 1821 and onwards, and I'm just jumping a bit here, um, the Ottomans saw the, the Greeks as breaking away from the family. They did not see it as an independence movement. They saw it as breaking away from the family. And that's why their reprisals later were significant, including the massacres and also hangings of significant individuals and elites. We often forget sometimes that um, it wasn't only Turkish rule. The Venetians were there in and out for a number of centuries with a particular presence in Cyprus, in a particular presence in, um, in Crete, in the islands in and out, and in the Peloponnese. So there was conflict that was ongoing. Their driver was aggressive capitalism. They were able to bring to, um, to the Eastern Mediterranean a mode of economic expansion that had not been seen before and Byzantium was unable to compete with that. So this is another major factor with the Venetians. And another issue, another matter that um, we often overlook is they had one of the largest fleets in the world, but to do that they had to deforest a significant amount of European forests to make those ships to sail. So the Venetians are high, were highly aggressive in terms of their um, in terms of their e economic expansion, but also they were highly feudalized. So it was a very structured society. To illustrate the point of whether they were liked or disliked, in Crete in particular, we have the highest rate of Islamization by a Christian population in the Greek peninsula. So you had high rates of um, uh, of Islamization, people converting willingly to, to Islam, and those people were left in the 1922-23 ex, ex, uh, exchange of populations, and today they're even still Greek speakers, but the sentiment is Turkish. In other parts of Greece at the time, if you spoke, if your religion or your language was not Greek, there was a tendency to move the other way. But I'm just highlighting the importance of Venetian rule. Now, eventually, that rule brought a lot of benefits. There was enlightenment as, as well, and it also, particularly in the Ionian Islands, it allowed for, for a greater sense of, of liberal thought and so forth. So well, there were really two drivers, two occupations uh, as such. Now, Ottoman rule. 
The Ottomans separated their population based on religion, not ethnicity. They had no concept of um, whether you were a, a, a Greek or Armenian, a Slav or whatever. All they were interested in was religion and they called it Millet and they based that on, on, that, on that basis. They had four Millets largely. They had the large Orthodox Millet which was run by the ecumenical patriarch who was seen as a servant of the Sultan. Who was seen as a servant of the Sultan. He acted with autonomy in religious events and doctrine but not separate from the Sultan. They had a largely centralised government which was Islamic in nature and tradition and that, that was driven by the notion again that, uh, that Islam is the faith of the empire. That doesn't mean that uh, Muslims fought against, did not fight against Muslims in their expansion from the 11th century. Brothers would fight against themselves and kingdoms would fight against themselves. So that was nothing, nothing new. Um, there were also a number of Greek elites. Because the Ottomans didn't value the merchant class, they established a bureaucracy based on Christian populations. Largely Greek speaking. So I'm very careful with the word that the word of Greek speaking. Because in Anatolia, in the East, virtually everyone was Greek speaking, but you had an ethnic Armenian population that was Greek speaking but identified as Armenian as well and they had their own uh, millet as such. These elites were largely concentrated in an area of Constantinople at the time which was called Fanari and it's, and it's still there today, the Fanariots as, as, as such. Extremely competent bureaucrats, extremely well educated and felt that they were carrying the line of Byzantium. So they saw uh, a, a continuity in history and they were the new nobles as such. And later you'll see they were actually nobles in many respects. One of the myths which I'll um, hopefully address next week is that Turkey Ottoman rule was brutal. Yes it was and I'll go into that. But there was a degree of autonomy. And that autonomy varied from place to place, and the Turks did allow for self-government self amongst uh, uh, populations. And today we have the, the word kinotita, which actually comes from the Ottoman rule, which they established self-government. So that, that was allowed as long as you didn't break the rules and you paid your taxes. They were big on taxes. If anyone's here from the ATO, please, here's an example. Having said that, having said that, there has been a significant overemphasis in, in history books over the last 50, 60, 7 years how, how bad these, guy, these guys were. Yes, there's an element of truth there and we'll go through that and we'll talk about it next week. Firstly, if you were a non-Muslim, you were not equal under the law with Muslims. You could not ride a horse, you could not carry a weapon, you had to pay special, special taxes and those taxes were on many occasions localised and that was based on the notion that if I include a number of taxes I can control the demographics of an area. What do I mean by that? Certain taxes prompted individuals to convert, other taxes did not and so forth. So there was, there was um, a, a plan in that taxation system as well. Could not marry a Muslim, but the most significant event in my opinion was the child levy. Now I'll read you something that was uh, documented by possibly one of the most eminent historians, Greek, Greek background, American born professor of uh, Oriental history. His name is Stavrianos, the Balkans since 1453. 
Um, it's not bedtime reading. Um, it's rather, rather deep. But I'll come back to his comments. I just want to tell you what he wrote and what I think after this. So he goes on to say, quote, contemporary evidence concerning the child abuse, the, sorry, the child tribute, is significantly contradic contradictory. Some observers emphasize the reluctance of Christian parents to part with their sons. In contrast, the Venetian ambassador reported essentially that Christian parents regarded the child tribute a boon which provided their sons with an opportunity for, for advancement. He also goes to say, thus slavery under Islam involves servitude, but very little social inferiority. In his conclusion, he says, the net result of this remarkable system was that a great Muslim empire was based upon Christian brawn and Christian brain. During the period 1453 to 1623, the empire was at its height. Only five of the 47 uh, granted visas, in other words, um, local lords and, and um, uh, regional commanders, were of Turkish origin. The remaining 46 consisted of 11 Albanians, 11 South Slavs, 6 Greece, etc., 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 Armenians, and so forth. Stavrianos is an Oriental historian. He looks at the Orient from a different perspective. He doesn't see, see it from the perspective of the sick man of Europe. His argument is that slavery during the Ottoman periods offered, uh, and it was slavery, make no, no bones about it, offered the population a way out. So social mobility during the Ottomans was moving from a Christian base to an Islamic base. How do you do that? You either convert or you, you provide a child. And that child was taken on at the age of seven and then was completely Islamis, Islamicized and many times would find itself at the gates of Constantinople fighting the other Christians. Now, this is Stavrianos. He's significantly, significantly more eminent than, than most of the historians that I know. But make no mistake, it was slavery. So if you look at Byzantine documents of the time, and if you look at a whole range of other things, there is the, the cries of the parents that lost, lost those children, and, and the cries of generations still remained. Ironically, when the Turks entered, all their army were ethnic Turks. By the time they fell in the, in the, in the 20, early 20th century, most of their army, the vast majority of their armies, were made up of former Christian children and soldiers through generation. So that's Stavrianos. I raised Stavrianos because he's a standard textbook in the history of the Ottomans. Taught in Turkey, taught in Greece, taught in the universities of the United States. The, the notion that there were no revolts before 1821 is actually a bit of a myth. There were a number of re revolts, but these revolts took place in localised areas and they were spurned largely by the feeling of injustice caused by the, by the, by the Turkish rulers and sometimes, and sometimes and we should say this, by the Greek nobles themselves. So the feudal system still existed to a large extent. Um, property had to be earned, you had to work on it and so forth. So there was one in Epiros, and I'm, I'm going th briefly through this, I'm not going to go into any details. Um, revolts in the Peloponnese, and I'll come back to that, were significant after the Ru Russo-Turkish War. Now the Russians and the Turks were very busy in the last three centuries. They've had 12 wars together. The Turks won one. And that had a significant impact later with the Greek Revolution. Extremely significant. So we'll come to that. And that's why, that's why yesterday, one of those that were invited to the, to the celebrations for 200 years were the Russians. Not only because they had a role at the, at, at, at the Battle of Navarone, they had traditionally 
had a, an anti-Turkish stance. Why? Because they always wanted access to the Dardanelles. By not having access to the Dardanelles, they had to go from Russia right up the top, come down through Spain, come down from Gibraltar and come through. So that is the strategic reasoning which still exists today in one way or another. These boys here, the Olaf brothers that revolted in the Peloponnese against the Turks, were probably some of the most significant events to take place. They landed in money. And in money, they swept through the Peloponnese, trying to, to, to liberate with Greek insurgents. Why money? Money was never taken over. It was never taken over by the Turks. It had a highly autonomous region and largely to do, to do with the terrain. So their banner in 1821 was not Eleftheria and Thanatos, death of, uh, death of victory. It was freedom or victory. Freedom or victory. So they felt free. They didn't need to seek it. They felt free. This was a significant event. So the Russians land, they sweep through the Peloponnese, but as a result of lack of coordination, lack of uh, inspiration, it flops. Um, the whole revolution drops and ends. Then the enslavement takes place. So it was a very standard procedure. You go in with troops, you carry out, you clear the land, you enslave and you send a message. And this was also related to, to Catherine the Great, who still saw herself as part of uh, an expanding uh, Russian Empire. Now I come to my friends with the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna is extremely important because what it did in 1814, it told the great powers what won't be disturbed. So the great powers under Metternich, Metternich, the Austrian um, statesman, said that this is the map of Europe, we, you're not, no one is touching it, we're going to keep the balance of power there. And as you can see here, the Kingdom of Spain, France, and the Ottoman Empire here, as you can see, remains untouched. So in 1814, 1814, the great powers, the Holy Alliance had made a decision. No one's going to change the boundaries of the existing empire. Now things get interesting. So, here are some of the players before the revolt takes place. You have an obedient church, which initially when the revolution began, the revolt I should say, not the revolution, the revolt, we can, actually did say we should remain faithful to the Sultan. The Fanariots, which were the educated elites, would play a significant role later, but they ran the bureaucratic show in the Ottoman Empire. They were responsible largely for the, 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 the diplomacy and the advice. So then we have the mercantile class. The mercantile class was extremely significant. In other words, the ship owners and the merchants who later changed their ships into warships. So they were able to have a huge fleet and I'll tell you how that happened later. So they are seeing. But possibly the most significant factor in my view were the Western intellectuals. Now they were spurned on by Western ideals or liberalism the French Revolution, notions of reinventing uh, Byzantium. One of those was Adamantius Corais, who was anti-clerical, secular and liberal. By this time you had many voices and many opinions of what that Greek state should look like and whether it should comprise Greeks and others. So that's there. 
But you also have, which I've forgotten, sadly, was the American Revolution. The American Revolution, which was inspired by the French, had a significant impact on, on, on the thinking of the insurgents. We also had an American Philolene battalion that went over to, to fight as well. And uh, yesterday, Biden made reference to that uh, in the 200-year in the anniversary. These are the revolt triggers, and I'll, I'll, I will focus on the most significant events. So until July 1774, with the Kuchuk Kanyak Treaty, which was in Bulgaria, where the Russians defeated the Ottomans, the status quo in the Balkans was remained. Russia found a perfect opportunity to corner the Ottomans. And what they said to them was this, we've beaten you again. What I want from you now is to be patron of the Christian populations, to be able to have a mercantile fleet that goes in and out, to allow the Christians to fly the flags, the mercantile traders that I talked about before flew Russian flags in and out went up and down the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, but I will also set, I will also set consuls amongst the Christian peoples. The Greeks at first did not really grasp that much the Russian potential. It was more the Slavs, particularly the Bulgarians, who saw who saw the Russians as their brothers there to liberate. And that's another story for another time, but that happens there, down the track. I'm going to mention this bit, which is really important. So one of the significant um, impacts of, of the treaty was that Greek schools opened, particularly in Rumeli, in central Greece, where you had this, this blessed uh, priest, Cosmasetolos, who would go about and open schools everywhere. And that was one of the significant impacts of, of the treaty. So there was a view to the Russians at this time. I have deliberately put next to Rigas Ferreos, which I'll say a few words, uh, the word elites. There are two theories amongst historians. The change from the ground occurs from, from the bulk of the population or change from the ground or change occurs from the top. The first are called bulkists, the second are called the elitists that look at the least. Rigas Ferreos was one of those, and you'll make up your mind at the end uh, with your reading as well, what you think happened. So, he was a, uh, a Vlach speaking uh, Greek. Now, I'll talk about this in the last lecture. I didn't say Vlach, I said Vlach speaking. It's very different. So identity and linguistics are, 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 are very different. So it's very important to, about that, that bit. He is, is I would call, a Philonine in the, in the real sense. He sees himself influenced by the French Revolution. And he decides on his own, Rigas Ferreos, um, to start his own revolution. So he tries to engage Napoleon Bonaparte, he tries to engage the French, he also tries to collect money, and in his attempt to create an armed conflict, uh, forgive me, an armed insurrection, he eventually gets captured in 17, he gets captured and he's eventually killed and he dies. The revolt fails, it doesn't take off. But Rigas Ferreos, as I was listening to someone yesterday, is significant because it's one man that tried to do something that started from nothing. So the issue here is not numbers, it's quality. It's not numbers, it's quality that played a role. So. And of course, his driver was the Enlightenment. But the state that he was looking for was a, was a republic, a republic based on the principles 
of liberty, equality and fraternity. So the French were it significant. I'm going to go down to a little caveat here. Around this t same time, about 1821, the French had control of Haiti. Now, the, the five million or so slaves in Haiti that were trying to overthrow the French using their same ideals actually came back, were the first to spurn on the Greeks in their revolution. So the element of colonial power, the element of race, the element of so many things takes place. That's just a small little caveat, just, just to let you know that while the, the French were supporting the Greeks, they were suppressing the, the, the slaves in Haiti. Filiki Eteria, started by three individuals in 1840, 14. Remember when I showed you the map in the middle, in the beginning, and I said to you, Greek colonies existed everywhere. This is in Odessa. It was born outside, actually much closer to the centre of power in the Ottoman Empire, closer to Constantinople than what it would have been on mainland Greece. These individuals were largely young men, fanariots, highly educated, wealthy, and they established a truly secret society, and it was secret. And its objective was to spurn a revolt and bring other Greeks together to rise against the Turks. Why did they start it then? They started it around this time because they felt that after the treaty there, were, there was enough scope for a revolt to take place. The sentiments of the French Revolution were bubbling at this time. But still, we have no revolt. We still don't have a revolt. Now, this guy here should be one of the Greek heroes. And the reason being is that Ali Passa, who was located in Yanina, probably did more for the, for the revolution than most of the insurgents at the time. And how did he do this? Well, firstly, he was Albanian by birth. He was fluently trained in, Gre in Greek. In his court, he spoke Greek and was, was a great fan of Greek culture and civilization. However, he had one fault. He didn't like the Sultan and he wanted to run his own show in, in the region of Ioanna. So what he did is he started to have chats with the French and the British about expanding his power and his base. Meanwhile, in that, in that region, he also had many, many uh, supporters of Greek background and Turkish background. What he then did is that he decided to formalise a separatist movement. So Ali Passa was a separatist. He wanted to break away from the Ottomans. This then brought about a huge anger from the Sultan who sent thousands of troops which fought against, against him together with clefts and suliotes, with Greeks. So, for what it's worth, Byzantium had a tradition to fight with everybody, to fight between themselves, and to be friends with the enemy. So my enemy's enemy is my friend, if, you, if that can happen. So Ali Passa creates a scenario where all the Turkish troops and garrisons are forced to go to Yanina. So they leave the Peloponnese, most of them. At the same time, which is not really highlighted in, 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 in the history books, is the Turks, the Ottomans are fighting on the Persian front. There's insurrections by the Persians, and so there's forces there, and there's forces right up the top. So by, ninth, by 1820, you have this. The thought of revolution comes in. Now, I started off with revolt, 
and I said a revolt is an ins insurrection. A revolution is not. A revolution is changing the status quo. I'm going from tea to coffee. I'm changing the, the monarchy to a liberal system. So the thought of revolution, epinastasy, is turning the world upside down. So, with that in mind, we have a significant player that was highlighted yesterday in the 200 events, Ipsilantis, who, who was part of, of, of the Filikia Teria, and what he tried to do was start an armed revolt, which he did. But he did it thinking in two principalities where the Fenariots were dominant. He did it in what is modern day Romania, Wallachia, and, and the Danubian principalities. Because of time, I'm not going to go into the intricacies of it, but very briefly, he takes an army of volunteers together with volunteers from Romanians and others. He crosses the Prut River, he, he coincides with the Turkish armed forces. The Russians at that time change their mind and they say, no, nah, we're still going to back the Ottomans for a whole range of reasons, and they lose. That was one reason. But the other reason the Fenariots and Ypsilantis did not succeed is because the principalities were run by Fenariots. Fenariots were, were nobles, but they also conducted oppressive measures against the local population, taxation and so forth. So, net, so I'm just trying to take the romance out of this. So that was another factor that it didn't have. So these were independent principalities that the, uh, uh, that the um, Sultan gave stamp of approval. So they ran the show like, like, like New Ottomans as well. All right. So we have a scenario now that there is a sniff. And this is what we're talking about. There is a sniff about a revolution. Filikia Teria sends messages out, sends word that we, should, we are in a good position to revolt. It's what happens on the ground now that's important. Ali Pasa, who loses, however, brought together by default the clefts and the armatoli, which were basically the irregular, uncoordinated Greek army if you like. Irregulars taking a role. So they find an anti-Ottoman an anti position to base their fighting. So you have Ali Pasa, you have the Danubian uh, revolt, you have the treaty, you have the sense of liberalism, and what you then have is the departure of many troops from their garrisons from the Peloponnese going up. What that does is Kolokotronis is appointed, so the hero of the revolution, as, as military commander in the, in the Peloponnese. The Peloponnese is a special place because to win there, you don't win with a regular force. You win with the assistance of the terrain. So Greece, outside Slovenia, has got the highest ragged pe peaks. So its mountains are like at a high... Uh, uh, radiant if you like they're not in that shape so guerrilla warfare was the order of the day all the all the guerrilla all the guerrilla and military leaders together with affiliate Filikia Teri and others meet near Corinth at Vostitsa to discuss a plan for an uprising still no assistance from the great powers still no 100% revolutionary movement. By the 25th of March 1821, we note that to formalise that agreement, we go to Kalavrita, which is the 25th of March every, that we celebrate, where the flag and the lavara are lifted and the blessing takes place for the revolution to take place. Why? because they knew they had the advantage. 
Now this is very important from a military perspective. They knew they had the advantage and the advantage was that the remaining Turks, the remaining Turks had to go in their fortresses, had to go back into their castles and fortify themselves because most of them are gone. So there are two battles that take place and I'll, I'll just raise these two that are significant. First was the Battle of Tripoli, Tripolizia, that takes place in 1821. At that battle, Kolokotronis set the scene. So I'll, I'll throw in the, the gore as well, because we need to look at it not from a romanticised point of view. 10,000 uh, uh, Greek troops, irregulars, 12,000 Turks in that city, there were allies of the Turks, Greeks that supported them, that were remained faithful to, to, to the Sultan, and there were also large Jewish families that are lived there tradition that remained faithful. The Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish component in the history of the Ottomans is important because it was the Sultan that allowed them after 1492 with the Spanish Inquisition to come freely into the Ottoman Empire. So there was a sense of loyalty and so forth. But what the Ottoman state offered them is a universal state. It didn't offer them a, an ethnic state. So they were able to live peacefully and so forth. So that, that's very important. Kolokotroni besieges the town for a number of days. Eventually, he breaks through. But his order is not to take prisoners. His order is to take, kill, massacre women, children and everyone that was there. And that's what happened. Everyone was captured. There wasn't a soul left. By the end of that year, there wasn't a Turk standing in the Peloponnese. Now, why did he do that? There was a deliberate policy, and I'll tell you what the after effects were. He wanted to send a message. And the message was, they can be beaten. Think twice before you send any troops. I move on to the next battle near Corinth, uh, further up in the Peloponnese, the Revenakia, where a similar battle of one to three takes place and the Ottomans lose. So, from that time on, the British in particular start to scratch their heads and they say to themselves, oops, have we done the right thing and can we keep the Greeks on side, or will our arch enemy, the Russians, take control? So this is what is happening here now. So these are the, the, the political dynamics behind the scenes. So those two battles sent the message. And if people read some of the um, massacres that took place, they were actually opposed by Ypsilantes, they were opposed by many individuals, many Philonines changed sides changed sides, they went to the Turkish side because of what happened there. But that's the message. Having said that, having said that, the Turks created reprisals after Tripolitsa in Hio, Spetses, Smyrni and in other parts of the empire and they were as brutal, no less than what the Greeks were. But what is happening now is you have revolts in Macedonia, in Nipiros, in Thraki, in Crete, in Cyprus. I come back to what I said in the beginning. What binds these people? What binds someone that's living thousands of miles away that doesn't necessarily speak the same tongue? It's dialectical in different, different customs, but is bound by the same cause. So, by mid-1822, we have a scenario. Sorry, I should have shown this earlier. These are all the battles. This is all the places the battles took place, of which, I know it's a bit difficult to see, but they start. The Cretans, after 1821, had about 76 uprisings. After the 25th of March, there were between 70 and 150 revolts in Greece. Sorry, not in Greece, in those Greek-speaking lands. So it wasn't just a number of them, 
It was happening left, right and centre. As you can see, the more you go this way, the less that there are, and the more you go this way, that's because the centre of power was here. So Turkish forces and garrisons could quickly move in and suppress any revolt. Now I come to um, what the Greeks do very well, which is fight between themselves. Um, so the revolution from, 18, from 1821 to 1823-24, the Greeks have the advantage and they actually have, have captured most of the, the Peloponnese, but they are still a guerrilla force. Guerrilla warfare remains that, because that's the best way to beat them. It's not to confront them one on one. It's a, so if you think of the Viet Cong tactics, that would be the, the best um, uh, analysis or parallel. Civil wars break out. So this is what happens. So there's two civil wars that take place and they last for a couple of years. Those that supported the, the, the warlords, the Kolokotronei and all those guys, represented a, a tradition that was based on nobles and local lords. There were the intellectuals, the westernizers that said, no, we have to try and create a state like um, Capodistrias, Ypsilantis and a whole range. So the clash was there. The clash was between which way do we go? But there was an element of greed, of course. When Who's going to fill the political vacuum once the Ottomans go? And the nobles who fought the guerrilla war, and they did so successfully and bravely and heroically against all odds, said, I want his property and land. I want the remaining of the spoils. Civil war takes place over two years. I'm not going to go into that. That's been mythologized and that's been raised. I want to contextualize it for you more, more importantly. Here comes my friend, Ibrahim Pasha, who comes with a fleet in 1825 and says, OK, I've been sent by the Sultan. You guys, we're going to clear you out of the Peloponnese. So he lands, lands down the bottom of the Peloponnese and over two, two years, he sweeps right through. Right through, he goes right up to, up to the top, takes most of the territory that was won, but it's still a stalemate. The Greeks control the mountains, he control, call, controls the lower fields. Egyptian, he doesn't leave till 1830 and he doesn't, and he doesn't surrender to the Greeks, he surrenders to the French. And that's just to show you how he feels um, a sense of inferiority if, if, he, if he actually uh, surrendered to the Greeks. Ibrahim Pasha, due to, to their, their warfare, causes a number of massacres and causes a great deal of suffering to the local populations. This triggers sympathy from the West. It triggers more Philolene volunteers. It causes Lord Byron to go to Mesologi and so forth, who becomes the, the PR boy for the Greek Revolution in Western Europe. Sieges start to take place from Ibrahim Pasha, particularly in Mesologi, and we have those those pictures of De La, those paintings of Delacroix, which romanticise the coming out of Mesologi, of the mothers and children, and so forth. So you have that scenario. In the meantime, the Greeks can't get their act together. So they put at least three provisional governments, but they finally, they finally formalise a constitution at Epidavros. Now, here, here things get move up a tempo. Now we're talking about revolution. We're talking about revolution because the great powers say Firstly, Britain breaks off. How does Britain break off? Britain says, I think you guys 
are probably going to win at the end. Why? Because you have a guerrilla force. How long can, can the Turks and the Egyptians remain in the Peloponnese? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a loan. So the first loans that Greece experienced 10 years ago have a long history. They actually date back a while. But that was Britain's way of securing a stake in the potential kingdom that may arise. Two thoughts among historians, and I was listening to this debate yesterday. Thought one is Ibrahim Pasha comes, he clears the land out, Greece lost, revolution falters. Second case is because of their determination and there was no way back, no way, the bridges were burnt, yes, they would have maintained a guerrilla warfare probably for the next 10 years, and some of the great powers would eventually intervene, whether they liked it or not, not because they liked the Greeks, but to counter the Russians. So they're the two schools of thought. So we have the first break amongst these three powers. They get together, and because they're all suspicious of, the, of themselves, all of them are suspicious of themselves, no one trusts anyone, the 1814 Congress on Vienna is still in place. Met Metternich cracks it, he goes bananas, and says, what are you doing? We've got to support the Ottoman Empire. The British say no, the French say no, and the Russians say, we have to say no as well. So they sign a protocol in St. Petersburg in 1826 for Greece to become an autonomous region. Not an independent country, an autonomous region, which means the powers, the great powers that signed the protocol will have influence. Just a little footnote. Once the Kingdom of Greece became independent in 1830, the great powers left in 1922. That's how long their influence, foreign interference was there. So, autonomy, <coughs> fighting is still taking place. The Treaty of London then comes in, which says you're going to have now, because between that period and that period, they changed their betting. The betting went to the Greek insurgents. Now we're going to give them a, a, a Greek kingdom, but we're going to oversee it. We're going to manage it. We're going to be dropping in and managing as we see fit. Plus, we're giving them loans and we want it back. In order to reinforce the Treaty of London, because there were still ongoing hostilities between the Ottomans and the locals, so when they told the Ottomans stop, they said no, we're going to continue. The three great powers send a combined fleet which is much smaller than the Egyptian and the Turkish fleet. What happens on that occasion is the messenger, the neutral messenger from, from the British fleet goes over, tries to go with his little boat to tell the Turks, listen, let's have a bit of a chat. There's no need for this. There was no ground for a battle. The, the great powers did not want war with the Ottomans. That was the last thing on their mind because they knew the balance of power in, in the eastern Mediterranean will be changed overnight. But one of the Turkish soldiers or one, sailors on one of those ships, he may have missed breakfast that morning, but um, decides to shoot the messenger. By shooting the messenger, the, the, the great powers fire on them and destroy the fleet. And by default, the fleet is sunk the treaty becomes formalised and by 1822, I'm not going to go beyond this, by 18, 1832 we have the kingdom of the Greek state which is expansion above Athens and the islands. But to conclude, let me just say a couple of things. This state that we call Greece today took 127 years to reach its final borders, and we'll talk about that in Lecture 3. 
127 years. It was a bit each time with blood and guts, sacrifice. But there was a bond there. And that bond was Hellenism. Whether they spoke Slavic, whether they spoke Vlachic, whether they spoke Greek, and so forth. So let me conclude by what the Onisha Solomos uh, wrote in 1823, which was the Ode of Liberty. And he did this from his experiences. And he says, and I quote, I recognize you by the fierce edge of your sword. I recognize you by the look that measures the earth. Liberty, who sprang out of the seeded bones of the Greeks, brave as in the past. I greet you, I greet you. Here, here, Elefteria. I finish with that. Thank you.